Steve Gerber is smoking. My 1975 interview with the Marvel writer on a hot streak by Walt Jashik. In 1975, as a 20 year old college student and super comic book fan, I had the exciting opportunity to interview Steve Man Thing Gerber, the Marvel comics writer then rapidly gaining fans and traction for his groundbreaking concepts, characters, and stories. This resulting article first appeared on July 1st, 1975, in the UMSL Current, the student-run newspaper of the University of Missouri, St. Louis, which Steve Gerber attended in the early 1970s, and where I was attending and working as a student journalist and as one of the paper's editors. Although the original story and pics were reprinted in the popular fanzine Comics Buyer's Guide, this article has been little seen or heard until recently. Here it is. A man on the run groans because a female companion admits she is only 16. He's legally kidnapped her. A young poet recalls 1967, the year Sergeant Pepper came out, and a confrontation with a military scientist. A ghetto catches fire at the hands of racist militants. A southern bigot sheriff pursues his quarry, a black man, through a swamp. These scenes are from neither novels nor screenplays, but from comic books. The author is Steve Gerber, who was born and raised in St. Louis and worked here until he left for a faraway land called New York and the comic book business. A few years ago, Gerber was at UMSL, picking up credit hours. A few days ago, he was in New York, picking up the comic book industry's equivalent of the Oscar Award for being Best Dramatic Writer in the Field. Now in possession of a Shazam Award, named for Captain Marvel's Mystic Cry, and given by the Professional Association of Comic Book Writers, Artists, and Editors, Gerber has seemingly found ample direction for the creative energies he honed here in the Midwest. The award is no small honor, nor slightly deserved. The 28-year-old writer has produced some of the most sophisticated and powerful comic book stories to see print in recent years. For a man who frequents galaxies and dark swamps from behind his typewriter, Gerber seemed oddly at home in the Umsel Snackateria, which he recently visited for an interview with The Current. Sipping coffee, the bright-eyed Gerber was like an eloquent comic book character, a vivid combination of funny and somber. Quote, there are those who say that comic books are candy, and I can't disagree with that entirely, Gerber said. This is no substitute for reading good books, you know. That's not to say that they can't be more than candy. That's not to say that there can't be good books that also happen to be comic books. But I don't see just stopping and saying, well, because this is a comic book, it can't be anything else. It is a struggle to do something responsible in a media often justifiably attached for shallowness and banality, Gerber says. His impish grin then appears. Like the audience, oh, the letters we get. There's an example I like to use. Suppose Jeffrey Chaucer got fan letters, right? Dear Jeff, Really enjoyed Canterbury Tales. Far out, man. Would have liked it a lot more, though, if you hadn't put so many of your own opinions in it. Well, till next-ish, I choose Chaucer. Signed, a dedicated fan. The own opinions, he defends, are abundant in Steve Gerber's stories. And it is this strong thematic undercurrent that strengthens Man-Thing, Son of Satan, The Defenders, and other comic book titles Gerber writes. In an industry populated with superhuman beings and fiery monsters, Gerber stages his stories with deep human characters in intensive, often profound interactions. 
the melodrama and supernatural elements are there too, of course, but those are the blood and bones of comic books concerns and have been in the complex four decade history of America's most unique art form. High adventure and fantasy are common, perhaps not all unfortunately, to the hundreds of titles published. And the market is equally substantial. Millions of comic books reach their readers every week, and those readers include a sizable and increasing portion of adults, including many college students. The prime market is, of course, still children, and that's why comic books have been trapped in self-inflicted chains for years, absorbing ridicule and scoff. Some writers, however, realize that children's reading can be children's literature as well that the superheroes who dominate the extremely visual medium are actually part of modern epic mythology. And some writers, like Gerber, aren't afraid to cook imaginative stew that an adult mind can chew. But not everybody wants that. When Gerber wrote a gripping story about a student being psychologically, then physically murdered by insensitive peers, teachers and parents, he got some icy reactions. Quote, some parents were upset by the story because they said it was pandering to students, telling them that they are right and teachers are wrong. The point wasn't that at all. The story said that teachers can be wrong. I get these requests for greater objectivity. God, this isn't journalism, it's fiction. People don't expect objectivity of Joseph Heller or Salinger, but they do of comic book writers. Gerber gestures, as if shaking a beach ball or a bomb. We're constructing a dramatic event, not reporting it. It's fiction. Boom! People are expected to come to their own conclusions. Then he leans back, sighs. It shows you the state we've reached that people seriously believe a comic book writer can dictate opinions to them, that anybody can dictate opinions to them. They want opinions dictated, but minds simply write contrary to what they think, so they don't want to hear them. Close-mindedness is a target for Gerber in his stories as well. The swamp creature man-thing, which is without higher reasoning powers, can only sense emotions and, in fact, feeds off them. The empathetic beast is internally prodded when he stumbles into a town obsessed with book burnings. Quote, there are three or four times in the story, a book burns in Citrusville, Man-Thing 17, May 1975, when the opportunity presents itself for those people to say, stop, we've gone too far. They blow it every time. After the last opportunity, the death of the daughter of the woman who leads the burning, there was no place left for them to go but to burn the books, and in doing so, destroy themselves, actually, unquote. Gerber looks into his coffee for a long moment, quote, I relate the destruction of ideas with the destruction of humanity. That's what they were really doing. That's what they were afraid of in the first place. Gerber is one of the few comic book writers from St. Louis whose reputations have risen with the quality of their craft. Roy Thomas was editor at Marvel Comics, Gerber's base, where he would occasionally come up with a striking scene, such as an old man, a veteran of World War II and prison camps, telling a superhero not to look for scars they are all in the mind. Denny O'Neill works for Marvel's competitor, DC Comics, and wrote the acclaimed Green Lantern series that strove for relevance before it became more common in comics. An old man addressed Green Lantern, You've roamed the galaxy, helping green skins and blue skins. One thing I want to know is, what have you done on Earth for the black skins? The hero can't answer. Gerber, the latest St. Louis native to join those writers in New York, comics publishing hub, has gone so far as to actually set his stories in his hometown St. Louis. 
the son of Satan, battles atop the gateway arch and over Forest Park. And the school, seen in a controversial man-thing story, is the physical replica of University City High School. Gerber was voted funniest boy in U City High's class of 1965. The people he's known are, of course, reflected in the stories as well. But St. Louis has never developed a superhero of its own, partially because Steve Gerber says he never writes about one. Quote, a hero, in a classical sense, is somebody who is usually in control of all situations, has no real major flaw in his personality. These people don't exist. I've never met one. I've never read about a real one, so I can't write about one. The problem with heroes and the image they give to kids is they don't really question what they're doing. Superman never stops to think, should I have ripped that mountain apart? Gerber's smile returns, but he is very serious. Quote, what are the consequences of ripping that mountain apart? I don't want to encourage kids to do that. Kids should be asking questions constantly. I think virtually all the characters in my stories ask questions. The characters who don't stop and think are usually Gerber antagonists, the book burners, a mad Viking out to kill via axe all sissy men, vengeful lovers, the Ku Klux Klan, and of course, the devil himself. On the other hand, there are many sympathetic characters too, often on the road to ruin nonetheless, including a guilt-ridden advertising writer with a touch of Gerber autobiography there. The fans, a nucleus of thousands of devoted comic book collectors and students of the medium who absorb the work each month like it a lot. They gave Gerber his Shazam Award. A key in all might be that Steve Gerber isn't afraid to push limits, push boundaries, and push high adventure into the realms of operatic tragedy. And from the view here in 1975, it looks as if he's just getting started. Thanks for listening. PSS Postscript. I'm recording this in 2024. Some of the content in that 1975 interview seems a little prophetic to me now. We're talking about book burners. We're talking about race baiting. We're talking about racial violence. It sadly resonates with today's zeitgeist. Steve Gerber died in, I believe, 2006. We lost a great comic book writer. After this interview in 1975, he had yet to create his most famous character, Howard the Duck. That's why you don't hear Howard talked about in the article. And in fact, what Gerber was doing in the summer of 1975 was taking on the editorship of Crazy, Marvel's mad-like magazine. He went on to write a whole lot more books, achieved a lot more accolades, had a long but too short career. I hope you've enjoyed this look back at his early ascendancy. I'm Walt Jashik. This is Walt Stories, home of original short fiction and nonfiction by me, Walt Jashik. To read, see, and hear more Walt Stories, subscribe here at waltstories.com. Please feel free to like, share, and comment. Thanks, and have yourself a storied day. Thank you.